to all of you. I think this may have been the longest hiatus we've ever taken um, that I can remember. But when you have Christmas and New Year's on two Wednesdays, it definitely uh, pushes things quite a bit. But welcome back. Um, as we come to the closing of the book, we'll do the closing chapter or section today, and then we'll come back next week and we'll be able to go over the whole book. And then the following book is The Imitation of Christ. And this is $3, so um, you can pick these up. Yeah, if you don't have one. Um, before we begin, this is Christy's last time before she leaves for uh, Hawaii. And um, I wanted to give you an opportunity if you have anything you wanted to say. Um, it's hard for me to really say much because I, um, I've been on an emotional roller coaster for the last couple of weeks, but um, I'm ready. <laughs> um, and uh, I just thank you guys all for being such great friends and family of Christ for a long time now, and um, a lot of us. And um, um, Joe asked me Sunday night, uh, last Sunday night, what if there was anything that that you guys could do for me, and I didn't plan the answer that I gave, so I know it was from the Lord. So I want to share it with you guys too. And just pray yourself into this this vision and come see me in Hawaii. <laughs> All in favor, signify by saying aye. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got some prayer cards if anybody needs one, wants one. Um, and if you would please pray just for this initial like week to two weeks, please pray that I don't catch anything on the flight or um, it's it's pretty important that I hit the ground running, if the Lord wills. Um, I start work on Monday, and I'll, I'll fly out tomorrow. So, um, and and it's a believe it or not, it is a hard transition with the really hot weather and humidity and all that stuff. So, um, but people, you know, don't really take me seriously when I ask for that prayer request. But I was sick. When I went before, I was not feeling well for the first like month I was there, and that was really hard. So if you guys would pray for, for that, I would appreciate it. But love you all. Gonna miss you a lot. Really glad that it's being recorded, so I can keep up. Yep. And I've That's already right. read half the Elizabeth Elliot book. Have you read? Really? <laughs> yes. It's great. Are you good? Was helpful? Yes. Good. Absolutely. See, I gave her the book that you've chosen after this one. The Path of Loneliness by uh, Elizabeth Helley. I will uh, leave in prayer. Are there other announcements? Ron? But, uh, Al Dayhoff back. He'll be here for about a week, so be sure and say hello. Get to go yeah. Welcome back, Al. Good to have you in the house. Anybody else? All right. Well, let's pray. <coughs> Lord, your church, your people, you've made an amazing, an amazing array, both in the individuals and the way you work in each so marvelously, uniquely, beautifully. It teaches so much truth when we have the privilege of knowing each other's story in grace and watching you chart the course and melt the heart and focus the mind and shape the will. Several of us here have had the privilege of seeing that because we've been close to Christy. That is no small privilege. It's like being in an artist's studio, as Jeremiah described, go to the potter's house. 
and see the potter. Continue your marvelous shaping of your daughter. We all ask for help as she goes, that she would be undistracted from the points of providence that you will put immediately in her way to lead, to stabilize, to teach, to shape, to convince she's more weak than she thinks she is, and more needy of you. Help her welcome them all. With a bit of daring, we pray the same for ourselves. We need no less in this day. And we seek the same from you for us all. We thank you that we are still here to glorify you while still being so broken so fallen, so weak, so sinful, and so thoroughly redeemed. And we use our discussion, our listening, and our talking, our thinking, that we would be more like you. And we pray for this through Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> this last section has um, a great deal to, to do with the particulars of what is said and how we are to listen. <clears throat> and I want to begin, um, I have pulled it down here. I want to begin where we left off. Could you go to 232, please? <coughs> and then I'll, I'll jump to the end. <coughs> the top of the page. I am first to give you some directions for bringing your people to submit to this course of catechizing and instruction. <coughs> the chief means of all is this, for a minister so to conduct himself in the general course of his life and ministry as to convince his people of his ability, sincerity, and unfeigned love to them. <clears throat> For if they take him to be ignorant, they will despise his teaching and think themselves as wise as he. And if they think him self-seeking or hypocritical, and one that doth not mean as he saith, they will suspect all he says and does for them and will not regard him. Whereas if they are convinced that he understandeth what he doth and have high thoughts of his abilities, they will reverence him and the more easily stoop to his advice. And when they are persuaded of his uprightness, they will the less suspect his motions and when they perceive that he intended no private ends of his own, but merely their good, they will the more readily be persuaded by him. Go down to the next full paragraph. If ministers were content to purchase an interest in the affections of their people at the dearest rates of their own flesh and would condescend to them and be familiar and affectionate and prudent in their carriage and abound according to their ability in good works. They might do much more with their people than ordinarily they do. Not that we should much regard an interest in them for our own sakes, but that we may be more capable of promoting the interest of Christ and of furthering their salvation. Were it not for their own sakes, it were no great matter whether they love or hate us. 
but what commander can do any great service with an army that hates him? <coughs> and how can we think that they will much regard our counsel while they abhor or disregard the persons that give it them? The labor, therefore, for some competent interest in the estimation and affection of your people, and then you may the better prevail with them. You remember the last time I asked you the question, would any unbeliever say, although I don't believe the gospel, I know you love me? Is, is there anybody in your life that would say that because of the way you live with them? It's a very important question to answer. And you need not think long. And the answer would come very quickly. In fact, I'd go even further. Is any unbeliever who's really close to you in life, not from the past, not from way far away, but from right near you, almost on a daily basis? And it's an important question to ask. Go to 237, and then I'm going to a little bit more. <clears throat> just had this experience. Uh, Article 2, having used these means to procure them to come and to submit to your instructions, we are next to consider how you may deal most effectually with them in the work. And again, I must say that I think it an easier matter by far to compose and preach a good sermon than to deal rightly with an ignorant man for his instruction in more essential principles of religion. Yesterday I was working for a good portion of the day on the sermon and was visiting with an unbeliever who I've been spending time with. And that was so true. This time of the sermon, um, it was just not nearly as difficult as sitting and engaging with all of the questions and the struggles and the distance. Um, though there was softening, for which I'm very thankful because he's not softened for a long time. It was much harder to be in that room with them. I was dealing so much deeper with myself, I'm sad to say, than as I was working on the sermon. Okay, go over to, um, this is just an aside, 240, but it's an important aside. Um, middle of the page, because this is how DTS uh, began. And then in your most rousing examinations and reproofs, deal most with the ignorant, secure, and vicious that you may have the clear ground for your close dealing and the hearing of it may awaken the bystanders to whom you seem not so directly to apply it. These small things deserve attention. We used to be in a coffee shop and we were reading dead theologians and unbelievers started to pull up their chairs and say things like, you believe that crap? <laughs> and everybody turned and looked at me. <laughs> Go ahead, answer that. <laughs> and we outgrew the, uh, the shop. But it was wonderful as they listened over the shoulder. And all of a sudden, we were dealing with more than those who came sympathetically. Go to 242. <clears throat> Number three, top of the page. So contrive your questions that they may perceive what you mean and that it is not a nice definition but simply a solution that you expect and look not after words but things. Even lead them to a bare yes or no or mere election of one of the two descriptions 
which you yourself may be propounded. For example, what is God? <coughs> is he made of flesh, as we are, or is he an invisible spirit? Is he man, or is he not? Go down to number four. When you perceive that they do not understand the meaning of your question, you must draw out their answer by an equivalent or expository question. For if that will not do, you must frame the answer into your question and require in reply, but yes or no. Someone told me I've not seen it. Um, the, the documentary or the movie on Mr. Rogers, he used the phrase wait. W-A-I-T. Why am I talking? And he learned to listen before he spoke. Why am I talking? When somebody mentioned that to me, I went into the Proverbs. Proverbs 18.13, if one gives an answer before he hears it, <laughs> it's his folly and his shame. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Proverbs 21.23, whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Proverbs 27.14, this is my life first. Even a blessing spoken loudly early in the morning will be considered a curse. I wonder how much listening to unbelievers we do and questions so that we really understand before we speak. Instead of putting in their mouths, as it were, the digital copy of what we think they think, feel, and then speaking to that, instead of waiting, who's in there? Um, what are they thinking? And I'll just close with this illustration and open. Remember when Dr. Rizvi came the first time, Gil? Um, she was coming here and um, was dressed in a sari and said, after being here multiple times, can I speak with you? I said, certainly. And, and Gil said, she's from Pakistan. And so I went and read every book I could on Muslim evangelism. And her first question to me, she sat down. I said, first, can I pray in Jesus' name? Because I, I can't pray without that. She said, certainly. So I did. And she said, all right, question number one. And I'm kind of strapped in. Would it be possible for me to have known God but never knew that his name was Jesus until now. That's what I said. I went, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so let me read you Ephesians 1, verse 5. And I read predestined before the foundation of the world. And she went, that's it. I want my stars, you're a Calvinist, you don't even know who he is. <laughs> Second question. Tell me about Trinity. All the, all the books on evangelism said, hold off on the Trinity. <clears throat> so I started explaining. She went, beautiful. Boy, talk about shock. How God had gone so deep for so many years. And I... I was just mesmerized. Ask questions and wait. Okay. What do you think? W A I T. Why would you want to have any input after you gave us that quote? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it helpful? Just when you're listening to someone, wait. 
think of that scene in Braveheart. Wait, <laughs> you know, wait. Just listen, listen. Who is this? Where does the gospel address this person? Who is this? I will share with uh, the story of uh, Craig Kent, who is doing the mission work as a physician in Southeast Asia. He's a surgeon teaching all these cultural Buddhist and communist people. <coughs> and he has a small group of English-speaking class at his house. So he uses Bible material to teach their English at house, which is OK with the government. And his wife, as he teaches some other the skills with the ladies at house using English to do mission work. And uh, he has developed a very close relationship with a few of them. And one of them were <clears throat> dying with uh, liver cancer. He sent an email. He periodically sends an email because he's dealing with the Buddhist culture. So he has some questions, and he emails me, so we've been communicating back and forth. And they were struggling with the concept of God because of the communist influence. <coughs> Is there God? Is it real? It was unresolved the question. So Craig listened for a long time. And then after they finished all the talking, and he turned around and asked, question back to the guy who asked him, who is a physician? Said, that, do you believe you have a soul? You believe you have a body? He said, yes. Do you <coughs> believe you have a soul in your body? He says, yes. Good. And he said, do you see your soul? Can you see your soul? No. But is it real? Yes. That is exactly what the God is. It is in spirit, but you don't see him. But he's a real. Just like you believe you have a soul and you have a firm belief you have it. But you cannot see it. You cannot touch it. But you, you know you, you have it. That's how he approached this fellow. And then he started to soften from that <coughs> point. So they're coming very close. So he's building this long term, he's been there several years now, relationship with those physicians <clears throat> who's getting trained by him. Getting into that little crack and then building the relationship, delivering the English lessons, lessons using the Bible passages, trying to make them process it and he's gaining some grounds. So that's what I was yeah. referring to you. Wait, <coughs> wait, and wait. The, um, I was struck here, adding to that, um, look on page 248. I can't count the number of times that I've learned this. Near the uh, bottom third of the page, one paragraph up, I would, however, advise you <clears throat> to be very cautious how you pass to hasty or absolute censures on any you have to do with, because it is not so easy a matter to discern a man to be certainly graceless as many imagine it to be. And you may do the work in hand as well without such an absolute conclusion as with it or be careful before you come to your conclusions. I'll say after being here 20, almost 25 years of watching people, the same people, for extended periods of time, many who had what I had discerned were outward signs of spirituality. I've watched the decline. And many who because of the horrors of what they had been through in the fallen world when I encountered them were like this, spiritually. 
are ascending in faith. Be very careful about what you conclude in a one meeting. Watch, and you will be surprised to see often the persons who have been through the worst where the faith is hard to see through all the ravages and ruin of the fall. But it's very real and very resistant to being rejected. Continue to do this. And um, very, it's just been convicting um, how wrong I have often been about people just by getting to know them and spending <coughs> more and more time. Dr. F. Um, there's a um, common phrase in, in Hawaii that you hear a lot um, that is, is just try wait. It's just try wait. And um, it, it's a translation of a Hawaiian word, so it, it is sort of a, a you know, local um, idea, but um, it was the first. Um, the, I guess, admonition that we received in our volunteer group um, from our leader when I got there before, and um, it, it really did, um, I mean, one of the main points he was making is what you just said, is, you know, you're going to see a lot of different things while you're here at YWAM, you know, was basically what he was saying. A lot of it's going to be different than what you're used to. Um, and it's very important that you you don't jump to judgment. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was it was so helpful to me, um, and uh, really really ended up shaping my my whole experience um, because um, you know there there are a lot of different <laughs> differences and. Uh, um, some things I was not really comfortable with, but um, because I had been given that up in admonition, it was helpful, and it went right along with Virginia. I don't know if you remember what you told me before I left last time, but it had to do with the um, the way elephants enter the watering hole. Can you can you share that? That was awesome. I got this from a missions preparatory lesson at Redeemer. When morning and evening, the, the animals in Africa approach the watering hole to get their water. The others are around, and when the elephant approaches, before he, you can imagine what it'd be like if he went in at first. <laughs> you know. So when he gets close, he turns around and backs in. <laughs> and then when the other animals next to him feel that he's there, then they move over and make room for him. And then he turns around, head in. And the comment was, um, wait until the people give you room to have ministry if you're coming in. You know, they acknowledge that you're there and they make room for you to have ministry. And uh, it's been interesting to me coming here what, 16 years ago, I waited and one of the ladies made room for me to have ministry uh, in a situation and so on. Because um, it's so easy to go in, I know how to do it. And it just goes like that. Uh, but with the other one that's been on my mind since you brought the subject up, I didn't know the man himself. He had in Newark, New Jersey, what they, he called it, cross counter evangelism. Bill Ivers. <laughs> yes. And my pastor's wife had gotten annoyed. And he said, I have a sandwich shop, I have regular customers. He said, as I get to know them, over a seven year period, everybody goes through some kind of life crisis. <laughs> it may be illness, it may be divorce, it may be loss of a job, whatever. He said, I build relationships, and when they come to that crisis, then they're ready to listen, and they're ready to talk. They need somebody. And I remember a faculty wife at Wall State University in 
Indiana. Same. That's what I do too. There may be a, a pregnancy or a lost baby or whatever, and I get to know the faculty wives and when they're having an emergency, when they're having a real problem, then they're ready to deal with reality. Mm -hmm. But I did not remember I told you the African the, elephant story. I mean, it just, it, obviously I, I won't forget it, but it, I, that was one of the last things I heard before I left, before, so nice to hear it again. And, and then it just so melded with what the admonition was from the leader of our volunteer group, and, and I watched it work. I mean, it, it yeah, it was <laughs> a great, great administration. Now, I'd just like to bring up the point. I had no idea that that stuck in your mind. None of us have any idea what God might be doing right. through some contribution. Yeah. But we know that God is intentional. Mm -hmm. And His Holy Spirit uses it in His Word. Okay, let's pray. <laughs> what are others of you thinking? Does it ever become this idea of listening and waiting? ever become an excuse not to talk? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. And how do you kind of balance that? I'm just going to speak personally. Um, I ask often the person that I'm waiting with, I said, I, I hope you know I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. <coughs> I hope you know that. If you don't, then I've already got a problem. But a lot of what we've been saying, there's a lot I'm holding back that I'd like to talk. And um, can I talk? Can I have, can you give me, give me 10 minutes? And you can stop me, but can you give me 10 minutes? Because I want to, I'd love to tell you what I've been thinking <coughs> about what you've been saying. <coughs> and you got your finger, you can put your finger on the stop button. But here I go. So that I find out if I'm hiding. And if they're open, yeah, I I definitely do, especially as a conflict averse person. Sure, very easy to hide. But I'd say, even as a conflict averse person, I probably need to listen more than I do, and then talk. But yes, and so I I ask, can I talk? I will often, after I've done that, I will often say to somebody, you, you, put, you just pushed my pastor button. <laughs> <laughs> you can take your finger off it, but it's on it now. <laughs> Do I keep going? <laughs> they go, okay. I say, All right, here we go. Um, so it, one of the persons I've been meeting with, I had taken food over and she said, stop bringing food, bring money. <laughs> <laughs> well, <I'm> okay. <laughs> so I went to Walgreens and bought, you know, the, the money kids play with, thousand <clears throat> dollar bills. And uh, when I came by this past week, I said, okay, here you go. <laughs> and dropped it. And she said, that's not real money. So it's not worth anything. And I went, okay, you just pushed my pastor button again. <laughs> um, so, I don't know if I'm helping by saying that. Does that make sense? What would others of you say? Barbara you, wants to say yeah, something. Yeah, Barbara. Well, I just wanted Virginia to say that I, I, I have shared several times <coughs> God's goodness sovereignty and intentionality but you describe you know how two without the three better than I find I'm doing and I wondered if you say it again if God were she, she wants me to she say it again has appreciated your explanation of God's goodness intentionality and sovereignty. and sovereignty but she would like to hear you talk about how one is not valid without the other two go ahead right this is from somebody else I heard more than three years ago. There are three things about God we need to, to know. 
and remember, God is good. God is sovereign. God is intentional. I would have said purposeful, but same meaning. Any two of those is not enough. If God were good and sovereign, but not intentional, why wouldn't go anywhere? Who can wait? <laughs> when a Wycliffe Bible translator tells you to wait, you wait. <laughs> Especially since I've also been told by the leader. Um, if God were good and intentional, but not sovereign, he couldn't get it done. Couldn't get it done. <laughs> and if he were sovereign, and intentional, but not good. We'd all be well. We'd all be in trouble. And this is what Dave Dallas Willard calls a, an enthymemic question, and I'm going to explain it briefly. <coughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I've never heard the word either. Enthymemic. Enthymemic. Has to do with logic. It's easy to say A plus B equals C. And we can talk about that out there. But a question like if God were sovereign and intentional, but not good, I dare to say that everybody in the room went, it's inside. It's not something out there to discuss. It's inside, and it's gotten past the uh, barriers that we put up. So I was John Spaulding put me onto this article. It's available online called Jesus the Logician, using the word logic. Jesus the Logician by Dallas Willard. And in there, after he's explained what this term is, he uses four examples from the Lord Jesus' life where he used this approach. And then he uses himself. First came out published in the Christian Scholar, which was for people besides philosophers. Was Jesus a good thinker? <laughs> I mean, if he designed the world, how about that? <laughs> Do you think he approves of people making their living thinking? And I thought to myself, every Christian scholar reading that is being reaffirmed with what God is doing in their lives through this. And that's, um, it's, I'll, I'll honestly say, it's the biggest new idea that I've gotten since I moved to Chattanooga in 03. Al, you teach a lot about this. Do you make some comments? You know, um, our fundamental metric we work in is shifting from listening to reply to listening to hear. We found the greatest impediment was the noise inside, which often had to do with a wound from our childhood. In our studies, we found ministers go into the ministry in general fix something in the world, in their family, or in themselves. And that wound continues to radiate. And one of the reasons why I can't hear is because I'm so noisy. And so I tend to talk and project over top of it. We discuss this in the book, The Genius in Your Wound, including a chapter on you wire where you fire. What? You, in other words, Al Dayhoff thinks he has his hands on the steering wheel and drives on roads wherever he wants to, when actually the roads are mapped. And I just drive on where I wired, where I fired as a child. So I was raised by a schizophrenic mother. And, you know, that noise was immense. 
took a different angle that there's actually a genius in your womb. There's something that you profoundly understand. And, and we discuss in there, many go at our wounds with, do, you, do they get better or do they get healed? We took a different angle that there's actually a hidden genius. You actually have a superpower at the place of your wound. And that might be your optic on understanding the gospel in the world. Um, in, in my own life, um, from a child I had to read my mother's eyelash as to whether she was going to hug or hurt me. It was a survival instinct from a child. I knew she loved me below all her demons, so <coughs> I, I was actually deeply blessed. But I went through the world with that antenna. I get way too much information from people as a result of that experience. I think I tend to hear what you're thinking, not what you're saying, as a result. That's my evangelism. I tend to hear the image of God in the non-Christian sometimes. And I think there's a genius in the wound of the people in this room. And it might be your unique portal into understanding the image of God in the non-Christian. Even to the point where your silence is sending a message of understanding. We found this, that between two people, there might not be two people communicating, but four. When the image of God in the non-Christian picks up a message of dignity and respect from the image of God in the Christian, trust and communication start. Say that last piece again. When the image of God... We found this in our study of tattoos. We've done about 5,000 interviews right now. I suspect the image of God in the non-Christian has gotten so desperate to talk, it's writing all over its wrapper, and I completely missed it. In the absence of the role of the confessor in the culture, tattoos are exploding. Mm -hmm. But what we found is this, is that there is the image of God writing a message to the owner of the tattoo. I suspect in many cases it is. But the image of God in the non-Christian has an antenna and it picks up a message from the image of God in the Christian. In other words, it reads our motives. How do we know this? Um, well, one of the things we discovered is that the owner of the tattoo will decoy a person quite often. Will do what? Will decoy. What does that mean? In other words, I'll walk up and I'll say, does your tattoo have a story? Wait, I don't think you have a tattoo. <laughs> does but Will does. Well, she does. But Will I, I do. Listen, I have learned. <laughs> you wouldn't believe who has tattoos. Great grandma has tattoos. Um, I'll say, does your tattoo have a story? And the person will go, no, nah, it's just a drunk night. And I'll go, and, and I walk away going, see, I knew it. See, I knew it when actually that was the death of a two-year-old, and they really didn't want to tell me that, partly because they didn't trust me. So there's, there's a deep antenna in the image of God in a non-Christian that has a lot to do with trust. <clears throat> my, uh, my oldest son just got married a couple weeks ago. And he married a girl that was raised as a Jehovah Witness. And I went and spoke to her. And uh, she had been hanging out around our house since they'd been dating. And that the day that they got married, I I spoke to her and I said, uh, "You have a you have a good husband. He's a good man." And she said, "I know that." And I said. Uh, don't take him for granted. And she looked at me and she said, I can see that y'all love each other. Now, her mother and father didn't come to the wedding. And she was, 
she was devastated because she didn't marry a Jehovah Witness. And just like with with uh, 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 Drake at the recreation center, Drake is a is a Jehovah Witness. And when we first walked up to him, he told me and Ron that I can't help y'all because we don't believe the same. Wasn't that what he said, Ron? And but now his attitude is I've been around a lot of Christians, but I ain't never met been around Christians like y'all before. And it's because we're faithful. Uh, we've been there for several years now, and he know that, that there's no, that we're not, we didn't start this to get paid. And he even gave Ron a key to the recreation center. So, the love of Christ, if it's in you for real, they'll pick up on it. And and she every time whenever she comes around, you know, I have to give her a hug. Because it's real love and she knows it. And her sister is kind of pulling away from the witness and gravitating to Christ because of the love that they experience whenever they walk through the door. Young people just come to our house. I mean, and when they come, one young man, he brought his niece, she was 12, and uh, he was ready to go. And she would, and I said, uh, Sterling, she's not ready to go. And he said, Mr. God, nobody's ever ready to go when they come to this house. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the love of Christ and don't try to close the deal. Like the Bible says, some will water, some will put fertilizer, and some will bring the harvest. We don't have to bring the harvest every time. Uh, I've always been trying to... I've been thinking about this. Um, I've been going to the next to the next door. It's a women's prison... Uh, release program, pre-release pre program out on Moccasin Bend. And um, the person that I'm mentoring right now, I, this is my 15th person. And I, I don't, um, they don't stay in touch with me, which was very disappointing. <coughs> but I was told that the reason is that you're part of their past that they want to forget that they, they I, I am in, in touch with some, but not the ones that I thought would, you know, said, oh, we're gonna write, we'll answer anything you send us, you know, that kind of thing. So this, I, I decided to use a different approach and it's from um, the See Jesus uh, material. I've always wanted to pour in, you know, I only have a little bit of time with them just so many months, and there's so much I want to tell them. And uh, I just asked the Lord to help me with this listen stuff. And um, uh, just reading the scripture and asking, what do you think about that? Uh, and go, uh, preparing that way. And I went yesterday to the transition ceremony. My mentee is leaving on parole. She'll be on parole, and she's not in my area, so there's no way of, you know, day, of weekly contact or anything. <clears throat> but she spoke, and she said, when I read John 9 with my mentor, I came on that verse that said, once I was blind and now I see. She said, that's me. That was the way I was. And I just think, um, it's just such a marvelous opportunity. And everyone in this room has their pet thing that they do. But I just want to tell the women that on January 
the 24th is a mandatory teaching, training for volunteers who want to work with women at the prison. And it's mandatory, and it's only held twice a year. So if there's anyone here that would like to do something like that, I'll be glad to talk to you, and I'll go with you to the training. Thank but you. as you say, while they're talking, yeah. I'm hearing the noise in myself, mm -hmm. and I just, it, it's just, you said one time that um, it's just really important to have someone that you're working with, and wow, I come back just amazed. So the most meaningful times for me. It is. It's when I'm all alone with someone who doesn't know Jesus from a hole in the wall. And <laughs> I'm, I've said more than once in a conversation like that, I, I don't hear people talk to me like the way you're talking to me. No, no. Um, and, and, they, and they say, I can't talk to anybody around here the way I'm talking to you. <laughs> and also they're covered with tattoos. I have used that. This is uh, this, <coughs> this is just one. I mean, um, we've gotten close, and he said to me, uh, he really loved, loves my wife, and he said to me, "If you ever do anything to her, I'll kill you." <laughs> <laughs> and I told Barbara, I "said We're good." Because <laughs> I think he will. <laughs> Yeah, I have a question, Al. I'm going to confess my struggle first. The inner noise inside hinders listening carefully when we are dealing with these spiritual matters. The professionally, you know, as I told you, I'm a physician, so when I hear patients' history, I try to wipe out blank out everything I had previously so I am ready to hear it. So I have developed a technique myself that when I see a patient in the office, I finish him, finish the dictations, prescriptions, whatever done, done, then I erase all my memory bank of that patient's just like a magnetic tape, you put it on the magnet and wipe it out. If you ask me, what is the patient's name you, you just saw? I say, oh, wait a minute. I have to stop and think to jog memory back. That's how I train my brain. I have trained. So I can wipe out all I have talked to you 5, 10, 30 minutes with you. When I go to the next patient room, I wipe out. That's how I professionally trained to concentrate when I see the next patient. When I start to go into the, the blurry area, or obviously in the area of spiritual matters, sometimes with the patients too, suddenly I realize my heart is not as wiped up, blank, pure, clear. The inner noises start to come up, depending upon whether the person's problem is dopetic, homosexuality, Muslims, or uh, all kind of craziness issues. Once they start to talk, I, I really have to fight. Suddenly I'm not at the total neutral, clean, peaceful part. The noise begins to rise up here and there. And frequently I pray in the middle of it, I say, Holy Spirit, stop me. So I can hear it. How do you deal with that to listen without your own pre-notion, presumption, inner noise, so you're trying to filter it. It's, you shouldn't filter it. You should hear, so the pe person should feel so comfortable to open their chest. And sometimes I'm successful, but frequently I feel, whoa, I'm not quite pure, Gil. Will you help me out? don't know that I have a good answer, but I'll try. Um, 
the journey that I have been on in these past years is the role of the confessor. I think it is a, a lost spiritual art. Maybe we threw part of the baby out with the bathwater at the Reformation. And the role of the confessor is about listening. It's more than listening, it's hearing. Mm -hmm. It's more than hearing, it's holding. And, and what I'm discovering in my parish is that those three things spark faith and healing. I, I'm a believer. But the confessor has to learn how to take care of his soul. There's a chapter in the book I'm writing called Wash the Car. I have a black truck and it picks up dirt everywhere I go. You know, you, get, you walk, you go out of the car wash and it gets dirty. <laughs> it's the way a black car is. And the confessor has to make room. And one of the things I've discovered, and I'm a big believer, is it's getting back to Genesis 1 of walking in the garden. Mm -hmm. And God created obscene nature to heal the soul. This past summer, I went and rented a tree house for two months in Indonesia. I make no apologies for it. Mm -hmm. um, and it, God created his creation to heal. And the confessor needs to constantly be exfoliating his soul and distinguishing um, what is God's burden and what is his. But he created the garden, Genesis 1, to be that place in where the soul gets healed and the confessor continues to, to be able to listen and hear and hold. That's one, that's one thought. Joe, would you help? I know I can't. Um, because I've said here before, I uh, my soul is so noisy. Um, I'm all the time fighting, all the time fighting to quiet what's inside, so that I'm I'm actually present instead of future or aching over the past, but right here. Um, much of my life mission that I've typed out has to do with dealing with the noise on the inside. And I, we literally, I could hand that to you and I could show you the various ways that I work to stop it. But I have to keep changing because it is not predictable. It is not predictable. So one of the second things um, with the residents that I work with, uh, we work on breathing. And um, you know, and God gave them the breath of life. And the, I think it's a yoga of the soul where you're actually breathing in and breathing out. And I work with that for a year with the residents. And a third of them come back to me at the end of the year and say that was the most significant thing of stilling the soul. And so that's one of the, you know, my average resident will go, are you doing some kind of voodoo new age thing on me? And I go, absolutely. So, um, <laughs> but breathing. And resident that I try to work with we do it once a week and the goal is to get at the end of the year every day and um, and breathing is a, he has a huge presence in the scriptures so, <coughs> it's thank you yeah thing yeah I was uh, over the uh, Christmas holiday I tried that uh, interview which you said about the, the tattoo and so uh, it works. I mean, the individual told me everything about the tattoo, talked about the scarring that was in, that, in their life, all the way back to childhood. And you can see all, everything <coughs> that's you know, in the tattoo, what they were going through, and the reason why they had it in all their body. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's a story. Wow. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. yeah. A lot of the noise that crowds out our ability to really hear is political, and you don't know if my interest in that, but we have a lot of assumptions about people in poverty, um, about what's going on in public schools, and we've never set foot on a public school campus to offer to serve and to really listen. We've never talked to a kid. Yeah. And one of the newspaper articles before we started that I noticed about you know, certain schools, they interviewed a an elementary school uh, student, she said, what do you think um, society's problem is, or why can't you, um, I can't remember the question even, but she said, nobody thinks I'm smart. Yeah. Nobody thinks we're smart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you see statistics, you say, that's the problem, here's a solution, <laughs> but nobody listens to them, and right. so, you know, just giving them the respect to really listen. And we did go through catechism with the kids at the center, and you got to be flexible with those questions <laughs> in the catechism. It's not set in stone. They were answering questions of people in whatever century it was written. And these kids are answering, asking a little bit different questions, but they want to know the same content. They want to know. And um, so what the, what the author wrote about... Um, being flexible on that and really listening to their answer and just thinking they probably already got it. And they can articulate and give examples better than I can. And so don't underestimate and let that political, you gotta just, you gotta just turn off the radio and go out and be face to face with people to find out what's really going on. And the political culture doesn't understand, they don't get it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, for 10 months, I've had a 29-year-old girl living in my house um, who's a former drug addict and a lot of things. And um, I'm getting ready to ask her to begin a uh, period of getting her ready to launch. Um, so all of this has been speaking to that mm -hmm. and I've been listening for 10 months anybody who knows me well would be amazed and when I even <coughs> tried to say something I feel myself saying it so badly that it's just like Lord I really prefer to lead in strength but I think I'm just going to have to go through this in weakness. I'm not trained for this. I don't know anything about this. So, uh, you all get in on the front end of please pray us through this that first of all that I'll be able to convince her that I'm doing this for her good not because I want her out of my house. Do you feel comfortable saying her name? Remember, it's recorded. If you don't, that's okay. Her name's Michelle. Okay. And I wanted to comment to Dr. Beal. Take into consideration that there's spiritual battles going on when you start to yeah. talk about spiritual things. It's not there when you're just talking about the physical. You wanted to say something, and then we'll have to close. Um, I'll just say this is for myself. I don't know if anyone else experiences it. But my nature, when someone's speaking to me, rather than waiting, my brain is already engaged yeah. in the response. And uh, that's something I personally struggle with a lot. Because as a result, I don't hear the complete message. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to tell you what yeah. this is what it means to me. Yeah. Not that anyone else here, especially. Oh, no, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> Never happens. Never happens at all. Well, ne next week we come to the whole book and um, we'll summarize. And then we move on to the imitation of Christ. So let's close in prayer, all right? Thank you for Michelle and giving her 10 months in a home with one of your children. 
up the next steps for her, in a sense, never leave the lessons learned at kitchen table and dining room and couch. <coughs> Fill her heart with the wonder of your presence, Holy Spirit, and rebirth her all over again. If you've already done that, so deep in her in the knowledge and love of Christ, that we may buy her books one day. Thanks for this time. Take care of Christy. Keep us mindful and praying for her. And uh, use us in your day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for sharing. Thank you.